Hey, everybody, this is Tim Capello from the Lost Boys on the Nothing Shocking podcast. Proud to be here. Love these guys. Everybody tune in and listen to me on the Nothing Shocking podcast. See you guys. Want to know what's going on in the world of music? Then tune in to the Nothing Shocking Podcast, a non-genre-based, all-ages friendly rock and roll program. Join us weekly for interviews with all your favorite rock stars from the mainstream to the underground. You can find us at nothingshocking.libsyn.com or anywhere you download podcasts. We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These guys are 11. Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jeff Unteed, and with me in Dog Bowl Studios is... Coach Nez. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Lipson or any podcatchers. Like our Facebook page or follow us on X at No Shock Pod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time. Our sponsor is Ragged Records, located in downtown Rock Island, Illinois, and downtown Davenport, Iowa. We'd like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for allowing us to use their music for our intro and bumper ending. Tonight's guest is... Tim Capello, saxophone player. Yeah, uh, known for his appearance on The Lost Boys, yeah. but I still believe performance, correct? And songwriter, he's got a solo album, and uh, his colla- we just talked about his collaboration with Gunship. Yeah, uh, their latest release, Unicorn. And also, don't forget, uh, Tim Capello was uh, Tina Turner's touring saxophonist for years yes what a great interview let's get to it all right good night night. Tim, welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'd like to introduce you to my co-host, Jeff Antied. Yeah, Tim, thanks for joining us tonight. Oh, thanks, guys. It's a, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Okay, so this is going to be a, a funny little story i got to tell you about how we got in contact with you. So we've been doing this podcast for probably about uh, six or seven years, and I've uh-huh. always tried to find your contact information to send you an invite, and I could never find one. You're like You're like... The guy that doesn't have a contact information anywhere. So, I don't know, was it about three or four months ago? It was like it, it, toward the end of fall, uh, we had Bobby Steele of The Undead on. And we had the interview, and he talked glowingly about your contributions working with together working with him. I said, at the end of, in, at the, end of the interview, I said to him, Bobby... Do you have Tim Capello's contact information? Because we're dying to get him on the podcast. He's like, I do. I said, do you think you'd have any interest in, in doing this interview? He's like, here, here's the email. So we are so excited to have you on tonight. This is like, a, you know, I got a, a pinch me moment here. Yeah. Oh, I love Bobby. I love Bobby. And I love Diane as well. Yeah, they're She's great. Diana. Great people. She's great. They are great people. They're so cool. I've jammed with them a bunch of times. We just have such a great time. I've been to their to their house and recorded in their studio, and they're just the greatest people. They are. Well, let's get right into this. Uh, you know, you just announced on social media that you're going to have a busy uh, March. Um, you, you got some shows coming up. Actually, not too far away from us. You're going to be down in Carbondale, Illinois, in Chicago. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, so talk a little bit more about what you got coming up here for our listeners. Well, I'm. You know, I used to do something where I would try to book tours for either a month or six weeks or two months or something like that and and make sure that I got 
lots of gigs that all connected. And then I would take a month or two off and then build up an, another momentum for another tour. Um, now I think I'm trying to maybe do less gigs in a month, but do them every month. Hmm. Go out, come back home, go out, come back home, do a couple, come back home. And I, I just, it's just sort of a, an experiment to see whether sort of a constant flow of a little less commitment to being just like out on the road for a month or two mm -hmm. and then coming home and then just really not doing anything to just keep it kind of constant and just keep it like a more like a regular job. Very good. You know, we, we see a lot of artists now, uh, Heritage Acts, that are doing the, you know, the weekend warrior fly out dates. They're doing the Thursday, Friday, Saturday shows or what have you. Um, you know, for you in this part of your career, is that kind of like the preferential way for you to go now doing the fly out stuff, doing the one off stuff, doing the, the two shows a weekend type of thing? How's it work? Well, to tell you the honest to God truth, I don't really see the positive um uh, the positive sort of you know uh um uh, gains to playing anywhere on a sunday or a tuesday right it it just uh, you you'll just be playing to half a house mm. and so really i've only ever played fridays and saturdays mm. um but what i would do was I would, I don't really do fly outs because I have a very complex setup of both audio and video that I'm the only one that knows how to do it. And I go out with all my own equipment and I mix from the stage and I send a couple of feeds out to the sound person and then they, you know, they make it sound good in the house. So, that's the way I've always done it, and that means I can't fly anywhere and do my full show. If someone wants me to just play, I still believe at their convention or their, you know, private party or whatever they want, then I'm, you know, all too happy to do that. But when I do my whole show, it just requires so much complicated equipment mm. all running off of... um this particular theater software that I, um, I just have to go in a van. I have a, I have a minivan and I put everything in there and I can go out for two days, Friday and Saturday, which is usually how I do it. Mm -hmm. And just sort of get to know the place for the rest of the other days uh, this time, I'm thinking about either one or two uh, gigs a week so that I can just go out to the gig, come back home. Or maybe go out to two gigs, come back home, and spend the, the time at home in just a little more consistent of a manner than I come home and I haven't been home for two months and my mail is just like <laughs> falling out the door and, you know, just those practical things that, um, you know, cause, cause I, I live alone and those practical things of trying to keep everything consistent and you haven't been home for two months. Understandable. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about your, how your stage performance has, has evolved over the years, like uh, your approach to performing live on, on some of these new tours. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of think of myself as sort of, uh, you know, like the way that John Leguizamo or Whoopi Goldberg or people would have these one man shows. Yeah. I remember seeing Grace Jones do a one woman show. Um, and I really loved it. I love, it's great to play with a band, but I love the consistency of being able to 
have a program. It's called QLab, and it's theater software, and and it enables me to link up my tracks and have loops to play as long as I feel like. I can jump out into the audience if I feel like it, and then come back, step on a little button, and go to the next tune or the next section of the song. So it's sort of I'm pretty committed to the one man show because it's me playing everything and singing everything, um, you know, of the background vocals and all the guitars and all the basses and all the drums. And it, it, so it's the sound that I want the most. Yeah. Very and cool. so I'm, yeah, I've been pretty committed to it. I'm making my second record sort of as we speak. Um, I'm not, I, I just moved. Um, I changed cities from Tampa to Columbia, South Carolina, okay. from Tampa, Florida. And before that, from just above New York down to Tampa. So I've been moving around a lot just in living. And so I'm pretty settled here now in uh, South Carolina, Columbia, and I feel really great about it. It's a great starting place for winter tours, summer tours, make my way up the East Coast, make my way out to the West Coast. And um, yeah, I, I really like it. It's, you know, you don't get settled in a new town and a new state and a new part of the country right away. Mm. You know, it just takes a little while. Oh, yeah. For sure. Talk a little bit yeah. about uh, making that a, a adaptation. I, I believe you know, Columbia, that's the where the University of South Carolina is, correct? That's right. So, it's, the cap it's, it's also the capital of South Carolina. I get and it's a nice, relaxed town. It's... Um, it's it's got kind of all the qualities I like, as you said, the university's here. So the it's very artsy place. So some, you know, a lot of my friends are filmmakers and musicians and stuff like that. So I find it pretty cool. It's 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 a little bit my my girl is up in New York. So we do a lot of fly in. We have a. At the moment, we have a long distance relationship. She lives in the city, in New York City, and, and, and I live down here. So we see as much, see each other as much as we can. And, um, that's one thing that we've got to, you know, sort of work out. That's one thing that's, I think, for both of us a little bit, um, uh, you know, a little bit of a problem sometimes. But she comes out on the road with me a lot. She's my, um, you know, we work together on a lot of these things and, uh, you know, work in the meet and greets and all that stuff. So so we we uh, she she comes out on the road with me a lot, too. Oh, and good. that's fun. Very good. Well, you alluded to making some new music. Uh, take us back to 2018, your first solo album, uh, Blood on the Reed. Uh, can you, t uh, you know, t tell us a little bit about the, the, the making of that album? Sure. Um as I said, it, you know, it was the very first time that I ever made a, re a record uh, on, under my own name. Yeah. Uh, you know, besides, I, I still believe, which wasn't even a single off the record. It just was a very popular song off the record. You know, a lot of the things where they had the, 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 the album was a little funny. And I think that a lot of the songs that were the most popular with people were not the singles because they were not the ones with the biggest stars. Mm, right. So people always talk about in their, you know, at, at least to me, which might not be really, uh, you know, people might not be exactly telling me the truth, just telling me what I want to hear. But they say their two favorite songs, everybody says are cry little sister. And I still believe. Mm. Yeah. And I think, so many people have said that to me that I think that they made a mistake in their videos and singles, but they had, you know, they had 
um, didn't they have in excess on the uh, soundtrack? They had um, Jimmy Barnes. They had um, the lead singer from Foreigner, Lou um, Lou Graham. Yeah. Lou Graham. So of course those were the singles, but nobody remembers those songs at all. They might remember the cover of The Doors, People Are Strange, People Say. But for the most part, I think the two songs that really have stood the test of time are I Still Believe in and Cry Little Sister. Mm, I agree. Absolutely. And, uh, I, I, you know, of course, neither G. Tom or myself were the biggest stars on that record by a long shot. We got buried in the sauce there. So... <laughs> Um, but still, it was great to be on a, a, what I believe was a triple platinum record. Yeah, it was a nice thing. Indeed. Uh, to be an actual artist. Absolutely. You know, earlier this February, you performed at the Mad Monster Party in Concord, North Carolina. The event was a star-studded lineup of guests. Can you talk a little bit more about that uh, opportunity? Uh, yeah. Um, I, it was the first one I've ever, I ever did. I believe in 2015, <clears throat> Evan McGar, who's the guy who runs that show, um, used one of those websites. Um, you know, the ones that say, find anybody anywhere. Exactly. And then you, you do and they say, if you give us 39.99, we'll give you all of this person's arrest record and whatever. <laughs> so, so he did it. He actually did it. And he called me and it was the first time I ever did anything related to either the Lost Boys or my work with Tina or just as myself. Mm. Uh, I also would, would perform the song and, um, and, and would have a great time. Um, this time, it was really, really weird. It was really strange. Like, I, I, I don't really know why I'm filling up clubs all over the country and why after, like, it didn't, my performance of the Lost Boys really didn't do anything for me at all besides, you know, make me some money. And, but it, 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 it really went under the radar and I think just got totally passed by. People love the movie, but as the movie has gained cult status, uh, my little 12 seconds has gained cult status too. I think the first part was the, um, Saturday Night Live, yeah. uh, little parody of me. Yeah. That, that really helped me a lot. Mm. And it made, like when I was, you know, when I did that movie when I was in, in my 30s, my mid 30s, and that meant nothing to me personally. You know, I, I got some money for the record, I got some money for the performance. And it was nice to have that. Great. But in, in terms of, in terms of, uh, say, getting me my own record deal or in terms of um, maybe uh, being able to go out and play like I do now. Uh, no, absolutely not. Nobody gave a shit at all. And then when I was their father's age, the people that were watching the movie, Still nothing. But now that I'm their grandfather's age, <laughs> for some reason, my my audience are people in their mostly in their 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. And I don't really. Uh, I don't really get it. I, I don't understand it at all. And so I'm going to tie that in to my last um, you know, I'm, I'm going to be playing a bunch of places in March, but when I announced that uh, Mad Monster Party, I don't know what happened. And I think these things take on a life of their own 
but I generally on my Facebook page would get maybe a couple of thousand new followers a year. Not a real big deal. Maybe I had 23,000 followers. One, that one post got me 4,000 new followers, maybe 2,000 likes. And it just, it just, for some weird reason, certain things blow up and then you just have no idea what made that happen. So my whole career, this sort of second career of my one man show, I, I have no idea how I'm able to do it. I just know that I write to people, they go, sure, we'd love to have you here. And I go and the place is full. And I just don't, for the life of me, understand it, but I'll take it. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Well, I'm going to explain something to you on this one. <laughs> so I hope you're ready. So just, the, right. just the other day on Facebook. Should I get a notepad? <laughs> I, I hope you can find it on Facebook because I'm going to tell you, there is a picture of you and a meme over the top of it. It said 15 seconds and he's an 80s icon forever. And that's what it said. 15 seconds and he's an 80s icon forever. And it's you and the, your performance in The Lost Boys. And that's what it says. And I said, thought to myself, wow, I think that, that he's on to something. Because I think in this day and now, people are starving for nostalgia. And they're grabbing a hold of it. 80s is making a yeah, little bit of a and, and, and they're starving for it. And, they, and, and finding iconic things. And, and Tim, whether you like it or not, you're, you're an icon. <laughs> that's so funny well and you've also had some netflix uh recently you, you worked on netflix and i think an fx uh series uh, where you had a, a, a appearance do you think that might have something to do with it too um yeah i did reservation dogs yeah. i did michelle wolf they did a thing called worn stories which was sort of like a nice little profile where I got to talk a lot more than I usually do. I usually just play a little bit of the song uh, and um, or perform or whatever. But um, that was a, a really good thing for me. So, yeah, there has been. It, 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 and, and I do this show on Access. Um, I'm a regular on a show called... I keep wanting to say America's top 10, but it's not. It's, it's, it's a thing. It's a, it's a sort of a, help me out here. Uh, access TV, Katie Darrell is the host. Mm -hmm. And for some reason I have a thing in my brain that I keep wanting to say America's top 10, but it's, it's not, it's, it's a show. Are you familiar with AXS? The, the I, rock station. Yeah, I am, but I don't receive it anywhere because I have Hulu and they don't offer access. Right. So it's a show that, that I'm a regular on. I think that kind of helps me a little bit too because I get to talk. That It's a it's a show, the top ten revealed. So I'm kind of close. Yeah. She, Katie Darrell hosts the top ten revealed, and I'm a very frequent a guest on that and and then and i and they'll say songs with the color red in them mm. or the top 10 saxophone solos of the 1980s or the songs that were originally broadway plays then became movies mm. uh it, 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 so it, they always have a subject to it so it requires a lot. You're supposed to go on and be an expert. So I really have to do, there are deep holes in my, <laughs> I was really a jazzer as a kid. So there are really deep holes in my knowledge of rock and roll. Hmm. I'm more of a, you know, when you play sax, you're more of a soul R&B guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can't tell you what Led Zeppelin album you know, any particular song is on. Uh, I can't tell you, you know, the Beatles I'm pretty familiar with, but I, I can't tell you much about the Rolling Stones. I can't tell you much about, you know, when I was a kid because I my favorites were 
you know, Charlie Parker and Lester Young and Joe Henderson and, you know, all these other saxophone players. Ooh. So I, I have to do a lot of homework, but I'm glad that I do. And I'm glad that I get a little chance to talk and kid around because it's, there's a, it's, I don't think it's the, you know, single most watched network around it's, it's, but it has a steady following and they really have great stuff. They do. They, they, they have wonderful shows that there, there's a thing called uh, the big interview. Uh, who's the guy from 60 minutes who, who does that? Dan, um, Dan rather. Dan rather yeah. does that. They have fan. They'll have like, just like a whole yes concert. You yes. know what I mean? The whole thing, a whole Tom Petty concert. And it's just the only place on the dial where you can, you know, where you can, where you can have that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I'm very happy to do that. And I'm happy to go out to LA to do that, uh, anytime I can. And that might help a little bit, but I still don't understand it at all. So thank you for telling me about this new meme. I mean, I I've seen a million memes with me in them. Mm -hmm. I think memes have helped me more than any other thing. I, I, I thought it was incredible. But hey, let's move on here. You know, this past January, you played with the uh, Red Room Orchestra at the uh, Great American Music Hall. Uh, this performance yes. uh, covered the soundtrack of the Lost Boys movie. Talk to a little bit more about the experience. Oh, it was so much fun because I got to play every saxophone part that was on the soundtrack. So if it was Beauty Has Her Way or, um, you know, any of the other things that had saxophone on them, I learned the parts and went out there and just went out there, jumped around a little bit and, and, and just kept coming out, going back. Did I still believe? Um, it was, it was, it was a really nice change to play with a stage full of really great musicians. Mm. I, I don't get that chance very much, uh, to play live with a band. And, um, and so it caught me by surprise how much I missed it. Oh, so cool. Cause they were just a wonderful band that just nailed all the nuances of every song. Um, you know, obviously, 80s is the synth era, so they just, the, the keyboard players just nailed all of the synth sounds, which is no mean feat on the Lost Boys soundtrack. Not at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, we even did We Don't Need Another Hero. Nice. Uh, we did, I did Tequila, which I do in my show, because it had the tie-in to Pee Wee. And... Um, so I got to play my wind synth and uh, run around a little bit. and Yeah, it, I, I had a ball. I really did. I just, I had a ball. They put me up. I, I really felt respected. They put me up in a, in a really nice place in the middle of uh, Japantown. And I had such a great time. Oh, fantastic. Well, you know, that kind of made me made me think there for a minute when you were talking about playing the sax for some of the other songs. As as a saxophone player, when 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 you're doing music, do you search out and and listen to other other bands or other things that are that might have saxophone solos in it, or do you shy away from it because you don't want to be influenced? How do, how does it work for you? Well, you know, it was one thing that happened that made me a little shy of listening to a lot of saxophone players. Although I do have to say very recently, are you guys familiar with the, the song by cameo called candy? Yes. Okay. So everybody out there, go listen to candy by cameo and check out the Michael Brecker solo. So, I learned that solo, wrote it down, played it five million times, 
because I just think it's one of the great saxophone solos in a in a in a you know pop or rock or funk um, song that was a big hit. Yeah, you know, it was just a magnificent jazz influenced, but still beautifully in the genre. Uh, because of course, Cameo is a pretty sophisticated band, mm. you know, uh, 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 tonally. They're, they're, they're pretty sophisticated. So I can yeah. see why they wanted that. And so, so that's something that I did recently, but I don't do it a lot anymore. Um, I had years and years and years of studying with the jazz great Lenny Tristano, where I would, um, he wouldn't even let you write him down. Mm. You had to listen to it so much and come in and sing it for him to the point where you would know the entire solo that when you actually picked up your horn, you knew the entire solo. So he, there would be the day of reckoning after you'd sung the first 16 bars or whatever you could manage. And then, so that was the way he taught. He wanted you to have a link to something you might sing to yourself. Ooh, interesting. Well, very good. Yeah, it was a great way to, uh, to learn. It really was. It was a great way to, uh, to learn about improvisation and developing your own lexicon on the instrument. Mm. So I used to do a ton of it, and now I don't do it too much. And here's another story why I shy away from it a little bit. Although the last story was why I decided to, <laughs> to break the chain and, 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 and learn a, a new solo. But I, the song from Mad Max Thunderdome, yeah. um, one of the living. Yeah. I, I played the solo, obviously. I played the solo on that and, and, and we didn't need another hero. And it was one of the living that was, that I was proudest of because it was a long solo and it was a real rock and roll solo. You know, it wasn't a poppy solo. And the last phrase that I played, I had inadvertently stolen from Junior Walker his last line on Foreigner's Urgent. So if you listen to Urgent and you listen to the last line of Junior's solo and you listen to my last line, of one of the living, you'll realize that I stole it. And when I realized I'd stolen it, I said to myself, I, I just was kicking myself in the butt, just going like, how could you do that? Like, like what, why did you do that? I, and I just had no idea that some things get, I love that solo so much that when you get so attached to something in the rock genre, you know, that's easy to, it's easy to sing, it's easy to play, it's easy to, you know what I mean? Like, I knew that solo, and because I knew it, I stole it. And I felt terrible about it. So, I've done a lot less of learning other people's solos. Plus, in rock and roll, the solos are usually pretty simple. There was there was a lot in that Michael Brecker Candy solo that I really had to put a little bit of sweat into. It, it was a little bit out of my wheelhouse. It was more jazzy. I'm, I'm really a rock player. And I like to play what's in my head. I liked, I don't like to play anything that I couldn't sing. I like to make melodies. So there's one thing that I can tell you that's kind of like there was one thing that I didn't do very well on with Gunship. And that was, there was another song 
besides the four or five that I played on, on Unicorn, that they said, we want to put like a really heavy distortion effect. Can you give us a shredding guitar solo? And as I was doing it, I realized I couldn't. Because shredding means that you're really not playing things that you're hearing in your head. You, you can't hear that fast. It's just running a bunch of fast, really, really fast licks combined with, you know, the hammer on stuff and then some really, really high notes where you're really bending them farther than a saxophone can. So I've never really been, although I have learned a lot of guitar solos, they've been more Johnny Winter or you know people that i that i know that they're singing what they're playing in their head i know that they're hearing it as they're playing it and they're playing what's what the 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 the, the line that's running just sort of through their brain hmm. you know goes in one side goes out the other and you have a continuous um, a continuous line of when you're going to rest and what you hear in your head. And I, that's how I was raised. So I found out that I can't shred. And I didn't want to because in order to shred, you've got to really not hear what you're doing. It's just too fast. It's just too fast for anybody to hear. You know, if you listen to Charlie Parker, who certainly played extremely quickly, um, he heard every single note. He just had that ability to really hear very, very quickly. But even he wasn't playing nearly as fast as Joe Satriani mm -hmm. or uh, Steve Vai or those guys or, or Eddie Van Halen. They're really not hearing what they're playing. As a matter of fact, Joe Satriani studied with my teacher, Lenny Tristano, and Lenny hated his playing. He just used to tell him, you're not, you're just playing these really fast things to impress people. You're really not hearing what's going on in your head. Or in your heart. Hmm. And Joe was always very upset about that, that, that he was such a good player and Lenny didn't like his play. Um, I wanted to, uh, talk a little bit more about your relationship with gunship. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I know that you, uh, got on board with them, uh, on the, uh, dark all day album. And now on this new unicorn album, you've performed on, I believe, but four tracks, can you talk a little bit more about how you got acquainted with the, the, the band and, and, and your collaboration with them? Yeah. Um, just like you, they asked somebody what my contact information, <laughs> uh, what my contact information was. Uh -huh. um, and they just emailed me and said, uh, we're named Gunship. Look us up. Listen to some of our songs. They suggested which songs to maybe listen to. And... They said, we'd love to do, you know, this song has a lot of Lost Boys in it. So we thought you'd be the perfect person to play on it. We want saxophone on it and we'd love for it to be you. And, um, you know, I don't think if they, that they might have even known if I was retired or not. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. pushing 70. Mm -hmm. I'm pushing 70. So <laughs> most people my age are retired and I... Believe me, I'm going to have to have an aneurysm on stage to get me off that stage. <laughs> just fall right over, hit a high F sharp and just fall right over <laughs> because I can't, you know, there's no way. It, it just, it just makes me feel too good. It's oh, too, good. it's too much of a rush. It's too, too, too much happiness to see these people that are, as I said, young enough to be my grandkids just totally into it and dancing around and smiling and laughing along with me and listening to my 
you know, idiotic stories about my career and past and things that went really horribly wrong and some things that went right. And, and so, um, I think they didn't really know anything about me, whether I was still playing, you know, people will sometimes ask me if they don't know, they'll sometimes come up to me. Somebody will come up to me in, in a gym or in, in a grocery store and say, you know, either they'll say, are, are you a wrestler or they'll say, <laughs> are you, are you Tim Capella? Usually what I get is, are you, if, are you triple H <laughs> or, or, you know, or, or there, there's somebody else that they mention a lot. Um, or I can't think of at the moment, but, but they say that, you know, if these two wrestlers had a baby, that would be me. So, <laughs> awesome. so I get a lot of that. I, like, I know you from somewhere. I, I, I know you from somewhere. And I said, I, I usually just say, have, have, have you ever seen a movie called the lost boys? And they go, <laughs> that's who you are okay so i get that a lot um and which is great for me it makes if people still recognize me close to 40 years later i'm just as happy as a clam mm. um and so i i do get that and so they 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 just approached me and said you know, are you still playing? Do you play? Are, are you, you know, we've seen some recent things of you online, on YouTube and stuff. And so, so we, we feel that you still are and you still sound good. So can, you know, would you like to play on this? And, and of course I just loved it. I, I just think these guys are the greatest. Oh, yeah. I, I just think Gunship is just such a great band and, yeah. and, and they're, they're so Go ahead. They're su such an incredible listen. I yeah. mean, just the, the the music that they 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 create is just so listenable. Yes, and it's it's complex, but not too complex that that it's just sort of you know impossible to decipher. They're 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 very involved. Their songs are very beautifully produced and very involved with lots of sort of weaving lines going in and out of each other and you know combining with the with the lyric of the song and the singing and all of their collaborations that they do uh, I, i'm just i'm just so crazy about them i i when i went to london uh, a few months ago to do uh, the video for um monster in paradise um you know i was we were finally that was the first time we'd been sort of um, they would send me tracks and I'd send them sax tracks back and we would just do that. We had never met. We had only, only, uh, uh, communicated uh, by email. So we had never even spoke on the phone. So that was a few years of that all through unicorn. And then they said, would you come and, um, come to London and, and, and be with us on this, uh, on this video. And I said, of course. And when I did, I had sort of been a little disappointed. I feel like I'm going to call them soon because they were very high on touring. They really wanted to tour and they wanted me to be a part of the band, play keyboards and saxophone. And I just thought, wow, that I, I would just love that so much. Um, but I know that they're, you know, they're, they're young, they're young guys and they all have young families. So they've got, you know, little kids at home. And, and I think that just is the very practical reason that they don't tour. You know, I, I've never, I've never had children. So I, and that was on purpose. I, I wanted to commit myself totally to music not that tons of people don't have families and balance it out with making wonderful music uh as gunship points out um but so far i haven't heard another word about it 
And it's been a couple, three, four months since that happened. And um, I sure would love to do it. Jesus. Yeah, we'd love to see you do it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would I would just I would just love to 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 be in a room with them with all the individual tracks and and hear how they put it all together because it's a little beyond my um my functioning mm. it, it's i'm more of just a, a a player and um a singer and a person who just loves mostly soul and rock and r&b and 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 that's why I like I've, I've written a million songs and don't really feel like I have the gene for it. Um, I really gave it a lot of time to develop and never really liked what I did. I, I do like the song Wiggle, so I put it on the track. Um, I am going to write one song and rewrite another song. Um that somebody else did with new lyrics um, on on the, my new album, and um, so I can I'm kind of like Tina or maybe Aretha in that way, not really much of a writer, but occasionally can come up with something beautiful. You know, Aretha has written some gorgeous songs. Mm-hmm. You know, she, she, I write she wrote Rock Steady. And she wrote, there's a song on uh, on the same album, Young Gifted in Black, uh, called The First Snow in Kokomo, that if anybody out there feels like listening to it, it's just, it brings me to tears every time I listen to it. It's one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard. Um, she was apparently head over heels in love uh, with Dennis Edwards at the time. And it brought out these songs in her. And she's as good a writer as anybody's ever been. That that song that I mentioned is is just one of the most, most beautiful songs ever written. Oh, fantastic. But yeah. and, you know, as far and and Nutbush is a great song. That was Tina's song. She wrote it. Fantastic. So so you know, it, it could only be when the spirit struck her, and that's the way it is with me. Yeah. I'm not somebody you know, who can sit those people I admire so much that are great writers, Paul Simon, and you know, just all these, I I love, um, I'm a real big James Hunter fan. If you're familiar with him, Um, he's an English guy that sort of does a bluesy thing, sort of similar to what I like to do. And I just think he's such a great writer. It's simple stuff, but in a certain way that, Billy Joel has of just finding exactly the right words to go with the melodies that they're so effortless. They just feel so good and so right. The way the syllables and the sounds of the syllables and the meaning all sort of coalesce around a beautiful melody. Um, I think James Hunter has that too. And, uh, and yeah, so there's 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 a few people that are sort of in my style that I really admire a lot. Very good. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, this one's probably kind of a crazy question, but uh, um, you know I, I'm pretty tall myself. I'm like six foot four, and so I would just oh. love to see what 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 your thoughts were on you know you, you're like six foot. I know you're more mostly known for like your size and appearance and stuff like that. But but can you talk a little bit about being tall and being a musician and being on stage? Or did did that uh, help or hinder your your career a little bit oh um well I, I'm, I'm glad i'm i'm glad i'm fairly tall i mean i ain't you i'm not six <laughs> four yeah you know you're you're looking down at everybody all the time yeah so you know i'd be looking up at you yeah um if we were you know when we get together I, i'll be looking up at you so i i, I think well, I'm going to I'm going to spin this around on you yeah. and just say in a very just perfunctory answer that just says, you know, 
I'm glad I ain't five six. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad I'm six foot tall. That's that's nice. And but that's just sort of you know a little taller than the average man. Yeah. Um, but tell me what it's like to be six four. That's what I really want. <laughs> I feel like everybody's watching me, but yeah, but no, it's funny. I got yeah, right. Cause I your gotta, head yeah. on a, on a, on a, on a crowded street, your head is poking up yeah, and my, everybody can see your head like everywhere you go. That's right. <laughs> going down, you're going down the aisle in the grocery store and your head is just above everybody else's head. What is that like? Yeah. Uh. I get asked to do it, you know, reach for the top shelf a lot, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> but no, Eric and I were at a show recently, and this this uh, the guy that was the announcer that came out on the stage to to introduce the show just looked like a, he was eight foot tall, looked like a giant on stage, and I remember I was like, my God, that guy's just enormous. And then and then later I'm walking back to get a beer back at the uh, back by the bar, and I walked past him, and I, I was a couple inches taller than he was. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, is that what I look like when I'm up there? <laughs> so he's he was just your size. Yeah, he was yeah. six four. But up on stage, he just looked like he was eight foot tall. Well, you know, you know what I get a lot. Like I'm still about the same size I was in Lost Boys. You know, in terms of muscle and stuff like that. So I'm six foot tall, and I weigh about two hundred and fifteen to two hundred and twenty pounds. Nice. And that's. I'm, I'm, you know, that's what I'm used to. But I think people under lights and greased up and pumped up. Tina was only five four, so around other sort of normal five nine sized guys, I looked people. So when people would meet me, that's the first thing that they would say. They don't really say it anymore, but they the first thing during my Tina and Lost Boys years when the movie was still out, people would say to me, geez, I thought you were big. <laughs> <laughs> Which for somebody who is killing in his butt, kicking his butt in the gym yeah. six days a week or seven days a week sometimes, that's not the thing you really want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought you were big. Like I went on, I went on, um, RuPaul had a radio show in New York and she had just seen me with Tina at Radio City Music Hall and then asked me to be on her or his radio show. And he said, I thought you were big. <laughs> I said, you just saw me last night. What, what do you think? I just lost 80 pounds like overnight. And she was like, oh, no, I thought you were like a like big, huge, you know, Mr. Olympia. So I guess it's all who you're around, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you were if you were walking, you know, like I, my head was sticking up, although I did notice that the generation in Japan was much taller than their parents. Mm. The people that were younger, teenagers, yeah. 20s, 30s. I think Japan is getting taller. But even at the time, I would walk up and my head would be sticking up over everybody. Right. And that was a strange, that was a strange, uh, that was a strange feeling. So I can imagine You've had to, well, it probably doesn't bother you, but you've had, it's, it's taken some time to get used to. Yeah. Well, uh, my daughter's fiance, he's six, seven. Yeah. Yeah. Former football oh, player. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So Jeff looks small in comparison to I him. know. I look up. Like, <laughs> this is weird. That's, I don't look up. That's a big man. Yeah. He's a big guy. I believe he's, uh, six, seven. 350 I think I think that's where he's at right now yeah he's a big dude so my god yeah he's a yeah, former uh, division one college football player so yeah he's a big boy 
But oh, I see. Yeah. Um, we're running out of our allotted time for the evening. Is there anything that we left off that you would like to plug or promote? No, I don't want to plug or promote anything. I just want to say hi to everybody out there. Say hi and thank you to you guys for having me on your show. I'm, I really appreciate it. I think I'm always surprised and extremely happy when people go through what you went through to contact me. I, I can't tell you, you know, that just really makes me smile. So thank you guys so much for letting me be on your show. I oh. really appreciate it. And, and a big, big up, big love to everybody out there. And uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Oh, fantastic. Well, this is how things are going to work out. We're about three weeks behind on our episodes. But once Jeff, the editing wizard over here, gets all the boogers taken care of, we'll get it all edited for you. And please, we'll, I'll send it to you. And please share it to all your social medias. We'd really appreciate it. Oh, sure. Thanks so much. Yeah, I love it. For sure. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, thank we you. appreciate it. We'll be in touch with you in about two and a, well, probably about three and a half weeks. Sound good? Beautiful. Thanks so much. Right. Take care. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye -bye.
Everybody pulls the plug and says their last goodbyes. Move to the sunshine, fight the grip of nights. If they ever take from you, then you plug out both their Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts.